many different passages. The one is a narrative, part of um, the, the life of Esther, um, and we'll explain a little bit more about her in a moment. And the other is, um, is, is a, a very picturesque and uh, prophetic kind of uh, word that uh, is addressed to, to the people of God. Um, uh, and the, the prophet Ezekiel is bringing <coughs> a word of encouragement, a word of hope in a sort of picture form. Um, both of these uh, come to uh, the people of Israel in a time of exile, the, a time of, of hardship, a time of difficulty, a time of questioning. Um, they are away from the, the promised land, they are uh, suffering hardships of various kinds, they're in slavery of a kind. Um, and uh, so these words, these uh, passages are both set against a background of difficulty and trial. And um, I suppose many of us uh, would, would regard the days that we're living in just now as perplexing, confusing, uh, challenging, both at uh, international and national level, and also uh, at personal level. Many of us face issues that uh, we, in ourselves, don't have the strength, we don't have the resources to overcome. Um, and uh, often that leads to questions arising about faith, about God's working in our lives, about God's purposes for us. And um, so in some ways we are uh, facing issues in a similar way to Esther and to Ezekiel in their day. Um, just to give a little bit more background to Esther's situation, um, she was uh, a, a Jew um, living with her cousin Mordecai, uh, him with a difficult name, uh, and in the city uh, of Susa in Babylon. So they were in exile there, a, a big Jewish community throughout the Babylonian Empire, but longing to be back in the Promised Land, but not able to go back yet. Um, now the king was a bit of uh, a tyrant, uh, he was also a misogynist, he was a male chauvinist pig, um, and he just wasn't a very nice guy at all, as you find in the opening chapter of the book where um, he is having a big feast uh, and he decides uh, to bring his wife, his queen, before the feast to display her beauty um, to this drunken rabble. The Queen refuses to come, uh, justifiably, you might well think, and so he dismisses <coughs> her and he has to find a new Queen. And now this book, uh, it never mentions God, and some of the issues that are in it, you think, wow, how could this be the way in which God is working in the world? Because the next Queen is selected by a process of a kind of Miss World competition, who is the most beautiful, as well as a kind of try before you buy situation, where all the ladies who are selected through the Miss World competition have a night with the king, uh, and then finally, at the end of this process, the new queen is, is uh, selected, and that new queen is Esther. In that situation, she hasn't told anyone who she is, that she's a Jew, and that's been all kept quiet, but she's now in a position of being the queen. Alongside this is the storyline, is running the one, about the, man, the man that was mentioned in the reading called Haman or Haman, however you want to pronounce him, and this, he is your, um, your baddie. He's almost like a pantomime baddie. He's so horrible and so bad. And he has got it in for the Jews. We don't need to go into why at the moment. It's all tied in with Mordecai, Esther's cousin. But anyway, he's got it in for the Jews. And he gets the king to make a proclamation to say that all the Jews in the, in the empire are to be slaughtered on a particular day. <coughs> 
and he's going to pay money into the treasury, Haman is going to pay money into the treasury in order for this to happen. So that's the situation that we find at the beginning of chapter 4 that we read. And why they're all wearing sackcloth and, and uh, ashes and all the rest of it. So they are uh, desperate for God to intervene, although they don't mention God's name. It's obvious that they're praying, they're fasting, they're seeking God to intervene and to change the situation. Um, and um, I, was, I was led to this particular set of readings by the, the, the thing that we looked at at filling station a few weeks back. Those of you who were there will remember that Sebastian, um, he took us to Genesis and to Jeremiah. He spoke about how in the Garden of Eden God commanded the, the first humans to be fruitful and to multiply, to tend the land, to seek the, the well-being of the earth. Um, and then again in Jeremiah, in the, the situation that we've got here in the readings we've had today, where the Jews are in exile, they're not going to get back for a long time, and the same command is given. Be fruitful and multiply. Seek the peace of the land that you're in and seek to settle here and to bless the land. The, and the thing that, that, that Sebastian was encouraging us into with that was to know that God has plans and purposes for each one of us in our lives. It doesn't matter what age we are, it doesn't matter what gender we are, it doesn't matter what background we come from. It doesn't matter what circumstances we're living in. God has plans and purposes for us. And he wants to take us on into them. And I wanted to try to uh, take us on a little bit from there um, in terms of um, being called by God and empowered by God. But one of the, the verses that... Um, Sebastian quoted was Jeremiah 29 and 11, where the Lord says, I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you, <coughs> hope and the future. And, you know, um, he, he went on from there and said that this is a reality for all of us who are believers. If we believe in the Lord, he has plans for our lives. And there are good plans of plans that uh, continue right through our lives uh, and uh, continue to develop and expand and to grow. Um, now, what I wanted to try to uh, focus on tonight was uh, the fact that, you know, sometimes we can kind of take that on board, but then it becomes kind of off-center because it becomes our plans it becomes God's plan for me and I become the center of it instead of the Lord uh, whereas uh, God's plan is for us to know him to love him to enjoy him and to be for him and so the particular verse that uh, first struck me and I wanted to focus on was the verse from uh, in Esther 4 where Mordecai says to Esther, she, she's nervous about this. If she goes to the king and he doesn't want to see her, she's dead. It's as simple as that. There's no other option. And so naturally, she's kind of fearful about it. She thinks, is there no other way? And this is what Mordecai says to her. Do not think that because you're in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. If you stay silent at this time, Relief and deliverance for the Jews will come from somewhere else, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. I love the, um, I think it's the RSV uh, translation where it says, who knows but what that you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And he says to look, this is the plan that God is setting before you. This is the place that you have. He's brought you into this position, your queen, by his appointment, not by the king's appointment, but by God's appointment. 
He's got this purpose for you, and he, uh, he has brought you to this place for this time. And it struck me that each of us who has believed in Jesus, we have received a, a personal salvation. We've received a personal relationship with the Lord. And, you know, we often focus on that. Um, it, it's a wonderful thing. But it's bigger than that. Because we're brought not just into relationship with the Lord, but into relationship with each other and into the kingdom of God. Peter puts it like this, he says, once you were no people, now you're the people of God. You are kings and priests of God. So he's saying that you've actually exchanged hopelessness, helplessness, emptiness for something far more wonderful, far more abundant. You're now called to the kingdom. God has called you and called me to his kingdom for such a time as this. And as we look at the turmoil in the world, as we look at the, the failure of leadership in the UK, the failure um, of leadership in church and in nation, as we look at the, the loss of the power of the institutional church and we see that um, the, the spiritual state of the nation going to the dogs, um, and you know, we see that right across the whole Western world, we could be tending to think, well, where's the kingdom of God in all this? Where's there any hope? Where's there any purpose, any direction? God has called us to the kingdom for such a time as this. Just as he called Esther into the desperate situation that she faced. And um, Jesus says to us, Fear not, little flock. It's a God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, to give you something that will last, something that has quality, something that has a, a, a depth and a strength and a life that this world, this feeling world, doesn't have. You notice. Uh, Mordecai addresses his words to Esther. He says, He's called, God has called you to the kingdom for such a time as this. But he also says to her, Look, if you don't do this, if you don't enter into the heritage that God has given you, into the calling He's put in your life, God will do it some other way. He's not stuck because one person doesn't respond the way he should. But he also says, um, or she says to him, right, okay, but I'm not on my own in this. Go and get everyone else, all the other Jews, and start praying and start fasting. You do your bit as well. So, as far as they were concerned, it wasn't just the one person it all hung on, but everyone, all the believers, were involved together. And each one had a role. That was perhaps a particular situation where one person's role was very distinctive and the other people didn't have quite such a, a, a distinctive role to play. But we're called to the kingdom to fulfill a calling that only we, only you, only I can call, can fulfill. God has called each of us to the kingdom for this time here and now to be lights in the darkness, to bring hope, to bring encouragement. And, um, you know, most of us probably in this room uh, won't see 65 again, maybe I'm being generous there. Um, but, you know, the temptation is for us to think that, uh, well, you know, time to sit back, time, uh, we don't have anything to give anyway now, it's all, it's all for the young people nowadays. But the call of God is for all of life and is renewed time and time again within our lives. Um, and uh, we, we shouldn't think that we have nothing to bring, nothing to offer. God has called us to here and now for such a time as this. And we're facing all sorts of challenges because of Brexit and all sorts of uncertainties 
all sorts of um, difficulties with family perhaps or with income or whatever. But if God has called us, he has a purpose for us. And I want to just, I hope it would be great if you could just hold on to that verse for yourself for today and for the future. God has called you to the kingdom, to his kingdom, for such a time as this. And he's got a purpose for you. Even now. You might say, well, that's okay for you. You know, you've, you've got um, your Bible college training, you've got your um, ordination and all the rest of it. All these, you're, you're a professional. You know, you, you've got uh, things that we don't have and could never have. Um, and, you know, that's one of the, the biggest um, lies of the enemy that has disabled so many of us in serving God and living for him and living in the kingdom. We think that we are not fit, that we don't have the qualifications, that we can't do it. And that's where, if we come on to the second reading now, um, where you've got the picture of the river of life. It's a glorious picture, this water flowing. And it doesn't, it's not really clear um, if you don't know the, the geography of um, Israel. It's not very clear where this water is flowing to. It's flowing from Jerusalem, which is up the top of the mountain, but it's flowing not down towards the Mediterranean. That's not the sea it's talking about that it's flowing to. It's flowing down into the Dead Sea. And the, <coughs> the glory of this river is that it's flowing into a sea that is absolutely dead and lifeless. You know, you can go there and you can float on the top of it with, without any difficulty because of the quantity of salt that's in it. Nothing can live in the Dead Sea. And what is the... the picture that Ezekiel paints show us fish fishermen fishing in the Dead Sea it shows us the, the, the river lined with fruit trees that bear fruit every month and we thought when we came to Sharon you know, this, this was the, the Garden of Eden the, the, the amount of fruit that we've got in our gardens and even uh, today I've got apples lying there in the, in the ground I can't use there's far too many of them well this is even more fruitful than Sharon at its peak, and the fruit start better as well. Um, but you know, the, the whole picture is of the freshening and enabling and equipping of God coming to provide for his people. Uh, and I wanted just to read another uh, short scripture from John John's Gospel, because um, in Ezekiel, we see the river flowing out from the temple, out from the, the sanctuary of God. But in, in John 7, Jesus, standing in the temple at the feast, says this. The last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and he said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given. So Jesus says, he takes this, this picture, because I'm sure that was in his mind, because the feast that they were at, that on the last day they had this sort of symbolic enactment of Ezekiel's vision. Only, of course, they didn't have a river. <clears throat> There's no river flows out of Jerusalem. And water is a problem for Jerusalem because it's at the top of the mountain. So what the priests would do is they would take a big bucket of water and they would pour it out. And that was symbolizing the river. Not a very great river. But Jesus says, look, if you're thirsty, come to me and drink and I will refresh you. I will be that river of life. And as you drink from me, so you will be able to be the source of refreshing to others. 
Because those who come to me out of their innermost being will flow fountains of living water. What does the world around us need just now? It needs refreshing. It needs hope. It needs purpose. It needs life. So many broken, sad lives around us. So many challenges and difficulties. So many hopeless people. And Jesus says, come to me and I'll make you the source of hope and of life and refreshing to others. So God has called us to the kingdom for such a time as this. For whatever challenges you might personally be facing, for the, the, the difficult and desperate times for many people in the world today. God has called us to his kingdom for this time now. But he also promises us the equipping, the enabling, the empowering, the Spirit of God to come on us, to be within us, to flow through us. You and me, no, no special people, we're all special, but every one of us has the promise of that same spirit, that same call, that same enabling. Let's seek him for that flow of life and power that he promises so that we can be the people he wants us to be. We can find the, the role he has for us and we can fulfill it. You know, somebody, somebody might say, oh, well, that's not for me, that's not me, I'm, I'm no use for that, I, I, uh, you know, I, I'm not able. No, neither am I, none of us is able in ourselves. But all of us are able in Christ. Because God has set his seal upon us, his love upon us, and promised us the empowering and the refreshing of his spirit. Called to the kingdom for such a time as this.